What can the crypto industry expect from the SEC in 2021? How are regulators observing the ongoing crypto bull run? And will we see more SEC action against cryptocurrencies? Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Forecast Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. It is my pleasure right now to welcome back Commissioner Hester Peirce of the Securities and Exchange Commission, arguably the most well-versed in digital assets, crypto, and blockchain among the five commissioners, and given the moniker Crypto Mom by the industry, as she does important work at the highest regulatory level for deeper understanding of this space. Commissioner Peirce, welcome back. Angie, it's great to be here. Well, it was a it was a busy holiday. Uh, the SEC dropped a bombshell right before Christmas a lawsuit against Ripple after eight years of XRP operating in the market comes this lawsuit. Can you help us understand the thinking here? What what is the message that the SEC is sending with this uh, lawsuit against Ripple? So let me start by saying that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily those of the commissioner or my fellow commissioners. And on an issue like this, where we're in active litigation, I really can't speak to the specifics. Um, so I've gotten a lot of questions about how I feel about the, the lawsuit, but those questions are better saved for later. I will say more generally um, that we will continue our efforts in this space. And, and so I think you know, by now people realize that we're active in this space. And, and so people should continue to watch um, both on the enforcement side, but we've, we also took some steps, some important steps right at the end of the year on the regulatory clarity side by providing some clarity for brokers that wanna engage in digital asset securities. And so I hope that people will pay attention to that and give us some feedback on that. One, one of the things we did in connection with that was to ask for comment. Um, and so I hope that people will respond to our request there and then continue to ask for clarity in other places where, where they need clarity. Yeah, that, that clarity is a little muddied uh, right now. And I, I, I absolutely understand uh, that we can't talk specificities, but it's, it's remarked that we see misalignment from different U.S. agencies on how cryptocurrencies are regarded. For example, of, you know, uh, XRP was determined a currency by the DOJ and FinCEN in 2015. So, uh, you know, disregarding the specificity of that example uh, for the intent of this question, why is there a, a current misalignment uh, between U.S. agencies? Well, one thing people should bear in mind is that each agency has to look at its rule book and, and align the things that it sees with its rule book. And so for us at the SEC, the question that we get asked most often is, is this particular digital asset a security or not? And in, in, in determining whether it is or isn't, we and, and lawyers in the field and, and people in the industry need to look at the SEC's specific rules. And we have a specific def definition of security, which is actually quite broad. Um, and that has caused some people consternation and difficulty in trying to figure out exactly what the parameters of a security um, might be in our space. And, and I think that's not only a problem with respect to digital assets, it's actually a broader problem because we have this very open-ended category called an investment contract. And that's intended to capture anything that looks like a security and acts like a security, but might not be called a stock or a bond. So you've got this very broad investment contract category, um, but it can be difficult to figure out whether something fits within that category. And that's where most of the problems arise. So something might be characterized as one thing by another agency, yet still be a security under our rules. And that can be frustrating for people. It, it certainly uh, it is causing a lot of uh, strife and, and uh, concern, that's for sure. How is the U.S. moving uh, towards affinity? Um, we are noting the Digital Commodity Exchange Act uh, that is proposed that would create a national regulatory framework uh, for at least the CFTC to regulate uh, digital commodity exchanges. 
Uh, does that clarify and simplify things for all agencies? Well, I think that Congress can play a role in providing clarity, whether it gives the SEC jurisdiction or the CFTC jurisdiction or some other agency jurisdiction that can be helpful. I will note that some, you know, we, we have made some progress this year, um, it, last year, I should say in 2020, um, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, the OCC has taken some steps to provide clarity, um, both in 2020 and just now in 2021. And we've also seen clarity coming out of places like Wyoming, so on the state level. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will, um, the SEC will take some more steps to provide greater, greater clarity. But I think it has to be a combination of legislative potentially, and then each agency working individually to address specific questions in its, in its domain, and then having some cross-agency work, which is happening, um, but I think we could do more cross-agency coordination. Yeah, there, there, there's certainly a chill right now. Uh, are other cryptocurrencies uh, that, that you know, raised and, and are active over the past couple of years, should they be worried? Well, again, I think that each, each, in each instance, we're looking at it on a facts and circumstances basis. And, and I don't want to speak to any particular um, cryptocurrency, whether it's in litigation with us or not in litigation with us. But I, I think everyone has to look at the facts and circumstances. And that's, that's why I have called for more clarity, because I actually think it can be difficult to determine um, whether something fits within the security bucket or not. And I think we could do more to provide some guide, some guideposts for what, what that would be, or as I've, as I've called for, a safe harbor, which recognizes, yes, there is a little bit of uncertainty, um, but if we can get these, these digital assets to us to a point in their life where it becomes much clearer which side of the line they, they sit on, I think everyone would be better off. So I'm hopeful that maybe that's something that we could we could actually get done in 2021. You know, that that deeper understanding is exactly why the industry has has given you this this moniker. Uh, you proposed the uh, of Crypto Mom, you, you proposed that three year safe harbor period for crypto token sales, really kind of creating a, a sandbox, if you will, that allows innovation uh, and uh, the, 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 the sales to to exist. Uh, without fear of direct uh, regulatory action. Where's the appetite on this, do you think, from, from your fellow commissioners? Can we see this enacted in 2021? Well, I think a lot is going to depend on who the um, chairman is under, under President Biden. And so that will, I think, help determine the direction that the commission goes on issues, on a lot of issues, but cryptocurrency being one of them. Um, and, and so it remains to be seen. That said, I do think that there's interest generally among institutional investors to see more clarity in this space. And, and so as the industry matures and gets more people involved, um, I, I suspect we'll feel a little bit more pressure from the outside too. Yeah, and I know that, you know, just th that there have been such blowback and certainly a lot of people uh, trying to understand your perspective on Ripple. And I, I absolutely know that you uh, must uh, adhere to the guidance of SEC rules and that you can't necessarily talk about it. But I do note that in one of your tweets, you noted um, and you pointed to the fact that this needs to be a majority decision by the commissioners, though the votes cannot be revealed until the resolution, uh, which could be a few years from now. My question to you, Hester, is was this a unanimous uh, vote? I can't answer um, questions about what the vote was. Um, as, as I mentioned, not only can I not say how I voted, I can't say how others voted or how um, the commission, I mean, obviously the, the commission as a whole, it's evident how it voted because a suit can't get authorized unless, unless a majority authorizes it. 
Um, but I, I know that that can be frustrating for people to to um, wait to see to see what the vote is. But um, I think that it's important for the agency to be able to to litigate the action. Hester, you note that you you just said that you wanted the you expect the litigation to continue for Ripple. The the, the comments that you made. Do you want to clarify that? Yeah, so when the majority of the commission authorizes a lawsuit, um, the lawsuit will proceed. And so people at the commission, commissioners and others, um, generally don't speak about cases once they're in litigation. Um, We let the litigation play out, and then we can have a conversation um, about the litigation um, if that's appropriate after the fact. So I'm hearing to be clear, this is not, this may or may not be your personal view, but it is the fact that litigation will continue because the authority of the SEC, the regulatory body that that you are a part of has to has to continue. Yeah, I think one thing that sometimes can be a bit difficult for people from outside the agency to understand and it, it because every agency is different and ours is one that's run by this commission, which is made up of five people, and I'm one of those five people. And so when we adopt a rule or when we um, when we authorize an enforcement action, we're all sitting there together and we all vote for it. And so if, if there are five people on the commission and three of the five vote for something, it will move forward. Um, in enforcement actions, it's often a unanimous vote, um, but, it, but um, it's, it's sometimes not. And so once that vote has been taken, the litigation moves forward. And often you'll see that um, a litigation ends in a settlement. Sometimes it goes through and the litigation actually plays out in court. You saw that in, for example, the kick case and the telegram case um, are a couple examples of that. Unicorn was an example where a settlement was reached. Um, So you have different ways for for things to play out. Um, And then once something is final, either final through a settlement or final through a court action, you can actually go to the SEC's website and you can see how the different commissioners voted. Absolutely. Well, let's let's talk about more broadly then. Uh, you know, in 2020, we really saw, uh, especially in the last part of the year, this increase, uh, as you said, of institutional dollars uh, flooding into the space. We're certainly seeing that. Uh, as the underpinning of of current uh, price of Bitcoin and the volatility. Uh, How have you been regarding uh, this rise of interest? And and how has that uh, been regarded by the rest of your commissioners of this space? Well, again, I can only speak for myself. And, you know, um, I I think the agency, the agency doesn't take a position in terms of of price or you know enthusiasm in the space. The only thing that I would say is that because they're you know people are looking for asset classes, new asset classes, asset classes that perform differently than traditional asset classes, and so um, I, I think it, it's helpful to help focus our minds that more people are are saying, hey, this is an asset class I'd like to take a look at. I'd like to be able to get some exposure in a way that's more akin to how I get exposure to other asset classes. Um, I'd like to get exposure through through my traditional intermediaries. Um, you know, obviously there's a big set of people in the crypto community who doesn't want to access crypto through an intermediary. That's the whole point of decentralization. And so there, there are a lot of people who have no interest in that, but some of the more traditional investors are going to need to access if they're going to be able to access at all, they're going to need to access through these traditional avenues. And, and so you've seen in 2020, some, some people come out, some companies come out and say, hey, we're putting some of our treasury um, funds in, in crypto, or you've seen, um, you know, you've seen well-known investors come out and say, hey, this is, this is an asset class I'm looking at. And so that will necessarily um, put more attention on, on crypto at the SEC. Now, that said, crypto is still a relatively small asset class, and the SEC has a lot of different things to, um, to work on. And so 
um, it's always going to compete with other issues for attention. It is growing attention, uh, nonetheless. Uh, and, and you talk often of clarity. Uh, certainly that, you know, that can be that can be muddied by regulatory action, not only from the SEC, but but other U.S., uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, and other regulatory agencies around the world. Um, what's 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 your goal when it comes to clarity in 2021 uh, from your position as commissioner? I mean, my goal is just that we would make some concrete steps toward providing clarity. And that doesn't need to be the safe harbor that I proposed, um, but it needs to be something to be able to tell people, one, this is and it, it, you know, this is what you need to look at to determine whether or not something fits within the security bucket. Or two, this is what you need to think about when you're trying to go from being a security to a non-security, um, because there's this notion that maybe something starts out being sold as a security, but but then down the road it turns into something else. So can we provide some markers about what it means for a network to be decentralized? I think that could be quite valuable to people. Um, and then there really is a need for clarity in terms of um, how do broker dealers and investment advisors and um, uh, ATSs, which are sort of exchanges, exchange light in the United States, how, do, how are they allowed to interact with digital assets, whether they're securities or not securities? Um, so I think there's a, a lot of room for us to provide clarity. I think we're getting a lot of good questions. Um, we've We've seen as I mentioned, Wyoming has been has been quite forward thinking in the approach that they've taken to crypto. And so there's some areas where their laws intersect with and their actions intersect with what the SEC does. So we can provide clarity there. Um, we can provide clarity with respect to DeFi, which is something that we, we haven't talked about yet, but I think is um, has had quite a year in 2020, and so I think it's important for us to provide some some help there for for people trying to understand how does DeFi interact with the securities laws. I want to absolutely jump on that. Uh, it, it is exactly top of mind for so many. Uh, we saw at the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, the the value of the activity was uh, I think half a billion, 500 million. And at the end of the year, it has absolutely exponentially exploded uh, to the billions. H how do you regard this space? When you talk about DeFi clarity, it really feels uh, on one hand, you know, it's great technology. And then on the other hand, really a, a lot of hype, uh, a lot of wild west kind of behavior. How are you? How are you, uh, as commissioner, uh, in, in your in your view, um, regarding DeFi? Well, I think it's hard to provide a clear answer to that because, again, DeFi encompasses a lot of different things, um, and some of them are probably well outside of of the reach of the securities laws. So, when I'm thinking about clarity, I'm thinking um, let's help people figure out when the securities laws might apply, so that. Um, we're not faced with the situation a few years from now when we're providing clarity through enforcement, which I think is is never a good way to provide clarity. I mean, enforcement actions can indeed provide clarity, but it's not it's not the right way to do it from my perspective. We want to provide people clear guidelines ahead of time, and then they can figure out whether how how they can do something so that it is legal. Um, but on the DeFi side, I think we we um, you know it it moves so fast it can be difficult to keep up with. But um, we would do well to to try to spend some time um, with people in that space and and thinking about where clarity might be helpful and thinking about where we can spot something and say yes, we know that's a security issue, so let's let people know that it is. Um, but again, you know, it, it's it, it, a lot of people are are very creative and and um, building really interesting things. And I think the concept of decentralized finance is a really fascinating one. 
Um, it is one that's going to be challenging to us because most of the way we regulate is through intermediaries. And when you really build something that's decentralized, there's no intermediary. Um, and so that's great for, um, for some things like um, it's great for resilience of a system, but it, it's much harder for us when we're trying to go in and, and regulate to figure out how to do that. Um, and so that'll be a new challenge. You know, if the industry is 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 going to be uh, listening intently here, and they're probably wondering, well, what about all the crypto tokens that you know uh, that people are working on right now? How do they get conviction that you know they go to market, and you know, for those who want to abide uh, by the regulatory uh, uh, you know lanes that have been set, how do they how do they do this? Uh, within the 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 rules of the law, so they don't get in trouble. Well, I think it that's that's a big concern of mine. Now, you have seen some projects that have used um, some of our existing exemptions, or um, you know, used Regulation A, which is sort of like a it's one form of doing an offering that that's not subject to all the rules that you might have in a in a um, in an IPO, for example. Um, but there are then questions about how you transform from being a security to being a token that's used widely. Um, so there, you know, if, if people look at it and they say, well, we know that we could do an organic launch where um, there's no, it, it's like a Bitcoin-like launch, um, but that's not always very easy to figure out how to do that. Um, and, and, and so I think it is really quite challenging right now for, for projects. And I think people are thinking about different ways to do that um, in a way that's compliant, but there are no easy answers because we haven't provided that clarity um, on, on how to do it. You know, as a, as a regulator, as a commissioner of the SEC, this is the gold standard. But as you take a look outside of the U.S., uh, you know, and uh, observe other regulatory peers, uh, how, how, how would you rate and compare uh, the U.S. against regulatory um, guidelines that are being set around the world? Well, I... You know, again, I think the SEC has hasn't done a um, fantastic job in getting out in front and setting clear lines for crypto. Um, and other other countries have been much faster to do that. Um, I think one one advantage for the United States is that it's a place where a lot of people want to do their development work, and they certainly want to um, interact with. Americans and they want Americans to be part of their network, but as as the the lack of regulatory clarity persists, then people say, you know what, it isn't worth that much. And especially if they think, you know, in, in a few years I might face an enforcement action. Um, I think the Telegram uh, the Telegram enforcement action was really quite telling for some because even though a lot of the activity was outside the United States its interaction with the United States ended up ultimately bringing that project um, to an end. And so I, I don't think that we've done a great job so far. Now, as I said, some other regulators are quite forward thinking um, in the United States. And so it's not, it's not one story. And I don't think that it's all a negative story at the SEC either. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hard on my own agency because I, I want us to do better. Um, but we have people at the agency who care a lot about this space. Um, we just we just made our um, our the head of our office that deals with crypto is is now officially a self standing office and has a more prominent role at the commission and a more direct reporting line to the chairman. And I think that that is a positive move. And and so and there's a lot of collaboration um, between our staff at the SEC and other staff, other staff and other agencies working on these same issues. So it's not all a negative story, but I think that the, the rate of um, activity on our part has been rather frustratingly slow. And that has real concrete effects on 
businesses that are trying to get into this space, but they need that regulatory flag, you know, yes, go ahead. Um, they need to get that permission slip to move forward. And until they get it, they can't do anything. And that means that some businesses can't hang on long enough to get that permission slip. So we we could certainly do a better job. Um, and, and I hope that we will in 2021. You know, COVID has really kept everybody in place. Um, but that doesn't mean that these projects are geographically tied to any one place. And, and so you make a great point is that there there seems to be, uh, uh, you know, as the regulatory um, uh, landscape seems to be slightly divisive because it's not aligned. And so for the more innovative uh, regulators outside of the US, it could be attracting that kind of talent. That That's the concern. That's the concern for the growth of the US and this space. Well, it certainly is. And, and I, I'm someone who loves to see the, the best and brightest minds um, wanting to come to the United States, wanting to work in the U.S. Um, and build things in the U.S., whether it's in crypto or in other things. And so I think um, we we send a message um, when we don't handle something new, um, so a new innovation. Well, we send a broader message. And, and I'm I'm not happy about sending a message um, that's not welcoming to innovators and innovation. But again, I, I, I'm optimistic that 2021 will be a time for us to kind of recalibrate. And so um, we, we have a lot of really great people in the agency and outside the agency trying to help us think through how to approach these issues. And so it's a fresh start, um, a new year, and, I, and I'm hopeful that it will it will bring more clarity. Well, that that move, that trend line uh, you, you, is underlined by a number of, of things that are happening at the SEC. Strategic Hub for Innovation, Financial Technology, FinHub, recently labeled to a formal office status. So that to your point, we've got a new chairman, a new acting chairman of the SEC, Elad Roisman. Uh, we also have a new uh, administration that's going to be coming in, the Biden administration. How do you think this all shapes uh, progress this coming year, in your point of view? Um, Chairman Roisman is fantastic. He, I've had the pleasure of working with him at the SEC um, for some time now, and he's he's fantastic. He doesn't have a lot of time to to make a lot of um, a lot of headway on crypto because soon the Biden administration and a, and a new chairman presumably will be coming in, um, but. He'll stay on at the agency, and he he has a real passion for innovation as well. So I think that that's uh, that's really promising. And then we'll we'll see what what comes. But um, I can assure you that I'll be talking to the new chairman about this space, and um, and I think uh, it's it's a wonderful opportunity for us to work together as a commission um, to to provide clarity, which. Which, which we really need to do through regulation. Well, as we wrap up this, this very candid conversation, Commissioner Pierce, I, I, I'm gonna ask you to join our forecast forecast. Uh, this is our look at 2021, but in retrospective, what, what do you think the top developments were in, in 2020? As we know that this is a foundation for what we're gonna be seeing this year. In, in your view, what were the top developments in 2020 that you paid attention to? Well, I think um, increased institutional interest in in the space. Um, I think um, developments in Wyoming were were quite um, meaningful in the past year. And then I would say um, the DeFi summer was certainly a, a, a big part of 2020. Um, and then moving forward into 2021, I think we'll continue to see institutional interest. Um, it, it will be interesting to see, um, you know, both what happens with with uh, Bitcoin, the interest in Bitcoin, and then also um, we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of developments around Ether. So, so that should be fun to watch as well. Um, and then I'm hopeful that we'll see some changes at the SEC in terms of 
predictions on what will happen. I'll just say generally that I think that I think we will make some strides. But again, that's probably informed by my optimism. Um, but I, I hope that we'll we'll make some progress there. Well, there's no doubt leading that progress will be you. Um, as you share your views from the industry uh, and share your knowledge and education, uh, there's no doubt the interest is increasing and uh, the, the focus is absolutely on, on the guidance that, that you and your commissioners will provide. Last thoughts on uh, how you, how you want to, wh- where do you want to leave us with, uh, you know, as, as you head back to the office? Uh, what can the community expect? What can the industry expect? Well, I think the industry can expect the need for me to hear from them, um, the need for them to interact with regulators. At the same time, I don't want them to spend all their time thinking about regulation. So I'm, I'm going to leave with the note that you should you should continue to think about how the technology um, can be used in developing your projects and, and remembering that um, you know, what it is that makes this technology and the community that's developing it um, a really interesting and exciting one to be a part of. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner Hester Pierce, for joining us on this uh, first of the year and and really an exclusive interview uh, that you shared with us for the first time on your views uh, to kick off 2021. We absolutely appreciate it. And uh, there's no doubt that we'll talk again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Angie. And thank you, everyone, for watching this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News. Until the next time. If you like that, come back for more. All you have to do is click like, always comment, we love that, and subscribe. And don't forget to watch the next one.